It's video interview Sunday here at Vale of Sound. And I'm very, very glad to have somebody on the show of which I'm like 100% sure that each of you will have at least one record in your record collection, hopefully more. So Dale Crover, thanks for being on the Hello. show with us. Thank you for having me. And yes, you should have more. You should have all of them. Why not? Well, according to Discogs, that according to Discogs, that would then be like three hundred records. If anybody of us has three hundred Dale Crow really? records in your collection, hit us up. <laughs> yeah, because it's not me. <laughs> it's, I have a lot of them, but I, I'm not even close to a hundred. I have to admit. But Dale, uh, yeah. what is the band merch that you are wearing today? Or music band merch, merch yes. or whatever. Well, it, it yeah, it's it's very unrock and roll. It's um it's an Indian Wells, uh, BNP Paribas, tournament shirt, tennis tournament. Tennis for those tournament. of you who like tennis, yes. Well, I'm I'm rocking a, f a shirt by a friend of mine, Bunuel from San Francisco in Italy. One of those very good trans global noise bands. Um, Dale, where are we you catching <laughs> you right now? Uh, I, I am in the California desert. Mm. So how hot is it outside? It's uh, it's not very hot, but it's very nice. That is a good thing. So, yes. Yeah. So I got two, mm, let's say, fun questions to start off this whole thing. First of all, which song do you like more? And you will get why I chose those two. Sorry seems to be the hardest word by Elton John or I want to be your dog by the Stooges. <laughs> oh, it's hard not to go with Iggy. <laughs> okay. For, for everybody who hasn't listened to... I love Elton John, to, though. For everybody who hasn't listened to the new Melvin's records, those are... Both titles have one of those words in it. And oh, you're second, right. Yeah. Now Second you know where question. we got it. Second question. Um, the record is called Bad Moon Rising. How much bad in mood. love with... Yeah, ba bad, oh, yeah, Bad, bad mood. mood. But then the question is still, how much in love are you with CCR? Oh, very much. But yes, see, play on words. Nobody seems yeah. to get that, which is funny. Bad Mood Rising. Perfect yeah, title I mean, like for, these, for these times that we're in. I've read that there is something in psychology called a halo effect. When you read or see something and your mind exactly. automatically associates something. So that's why I, I mean, I even got the copy over there and I have always yeah. read Bat Moon Rising. See oh, yeah. how, how much it goes. Everybody does that. In fact, um, yeah, uh, the, the last uh, last few interviews I've done, they've they've all They've all seen Bad Moon Rising and thought, yeah, you guys must be big CCR fans, right? Yeah, but now look again. Well, let's say I, I can imagine that you guys have a little little love for CCR. So I'm I'm least happy that it's not that far off. They're and... our favorite band that say they're 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 from the bayou that aren't. Mm -hmm. So um the, the new record, Bad Moon, Rise, Bad Moon Rising, is the first full length, full length, that you have been releasing on Amphetamine Reptile in 25 years, I think. Yeah, how, uh, we, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Sure. How did that long break in full length releasing on MREP come about? Well, I mean, he didn't really do records for a long time. So that's true. Um, but we've always done things with him, little things here yeah. and there. So, um, yeah, we just decided that we wanted to do this record with Tom. So he's a longtime friend, and uh, we thought it would be good. So did you approach Tom, or did Tom approach you? That's a good question. I bet we approached him, but um, but I, you know, I didn't personally. <laughs> I just heard it's coming out on Amphetamine and Metal. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. But Tom's been a longtime friend. We've done a lot of things with him. Even in the last, like, oh, God, I don't know, for a long time. But even recently, like, we just did a, we just did a, 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 
he'll he'll often do some kind of uh, a little mini festival or whatever at one of his bars. Um, he he used to have three or four grumpies this bar in Minneapolis. Now I think he's down to two, but um, but we played this one in northeast Minneapolis that we'd never played before. But now we've played every grumpies that ever existed, which doesn't matter to anybody really other that 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 doesn't live in Minneapolis. But so there you go, or that area. Is is that also is isn't there like a live record of a Melvins called Melvins versus Minneapolis, or something right. like that? You're right. There is. So so yeah. were those records or were those tracks then recorded at um, Grumpy's? You're probably it probably was. Yes, they were. Um, but I I looked it up and you never really fully left MRAP. I mean, like I looked it up and you released not many really. EP singles and everything. Um, but at the same time, of course, you also released lots of full lengths, mostly over IPSAC. But how did it come that mm -hmm. your discography in that way is split so, so strongly, so heavily? Yeah, I don't know. Um, like I said, we've um, remained friends with Tom for a long time. And, and uh, you know, he doesn't really do a lot of bands. He's starting to do a few more now, but I think he just, I don't know if he just got tired of it. Um, I think he got tired of the bands complaining that they weren't making a bunch of money. And it's like, well, dude, I mean, listen to the band you're in. <laughs> you guys are, are a, I mean, mostly the stuff that's on there is, you know, people with uh, special tastes. Yeah. You know, and it's not your, it's not your everyday, uh, your, your everyday music that you're going to hear on, you know, car commercials, though I think yeah. you should. Although you should, because it would be very suitable. But at the same time, as you said, most of the stuff on MRAP has never been really commercially appealing. I mean, like, none. There might have been a, a time in the 90s when people loved MRAP for being MRAP, but outside sure. of those lovers' circles. But um, as I said, you've, you've released many singles through MRAP. How important are those singles to you as a band? How important? Um... Mm -hmm. They're mostly fun things to do. A lot of mm -hmm. the things that we do with him are limited edition. Yeah. And, um, you know, it used to be where we'd sell like, you know, 20, 30,000 copies of a single, <laughs> you know, which I think we did with the Night Goat single. And now it's more like uh, two, three hundred, <laughs> you yeah. know, very limited edition stuff just because, you know, that's just the way things are nowadays. You know, there's certain yeah. people that are still interested in vinyl and vinyl sells better than it has in quite a while. But um, most people buy it and don't listen to it <laughs> like me. <laughs> I've got a whole I mean, like, as, as long as you still buy it room over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I could also I, just switch over there and, and back there. And I can my, show my you, wife yeah. always call, my wife always calls me crazy. I can show you my my two turntables that don't work. <laughs> I'm going to get them uh, fixed, I swear. Okay. Uh, back in the early I, 90s, when yeah. you first signed to MREP, um, you were already an established band. You know, the Melvins were right. already well, an we established really band. Well, we never really signed. Sure. We never really signed to MREP. Yeah, but let's say when you first released through MREP, right? Sure. Um, it was always like a handshake deal. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, like, I mean, it always has been. Weren't, weren't that the days when record labels like MREP and SST, wasn't that their usual way of doing business? I don't know about SST, <laughs> but, but um, but you know, with the few labels that we've, I mean, we've been, we were pretty fortunate to work with some independent labels that were very good at paying their bands, um, yep. <laughs> um, and and you know, luckily we didn't have too much trouble with with um, a little bit here and there, but I mean, yeah. for the most part, we got. We, we worked with people that were honest and paid us. So that was really good. You know, Tom was one of those guys. Actually, it's just guys named Tom, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Tom Flynn from Boner Records is the other Tom that I'm talking mm -hmm. about, who, uh, who we, who we still have all those early records are still on Boner, you know, and, 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 um, then, and it's and because he was honest. Came Mike, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. Exactly. 
Um, so. so, but but still, when you signed to MRAP, you were an established band. You had already released, or when you released through MRAP, but you were one among many other bands that that started a little 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 bit before you, like Helios Creed, uh, Vakao, Halo of Flies, and stuff like bands like that, right? So sure. back then, how did it feel to be on that roster? And how does it feel now, now that you are like one of a few survivors of that era? Sure. Yeah, we liked a lot of those bands too. And I mean, still do. Um, I was really into The Cows and and Boss Hog and Unsane and, and, and a bunch of others. And then, um, so yeah, so it was cool. I mean, they, they had a lot of really great stuff. And then now... I know he just put out this uh, record by this band called Mr. Flies, who uh, mm. um, are this two-piece from Chicago. Mm. They just played a show with us in, in Memphis recently. And they're really good. So there's some there's some new music that that he's put out that that mm. um, is new, a new band, a new band that's not 40 years old. <laughs> but isn't correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Mr. Flies also like isn't there a connection to the Melvins? Oh, other than other than um I think Buzz maybe played some guitar on, on their record. Mm -hmm. And I think Kevin did as well. Kevin Mass, Kevin yeah, Romanus yeah. from from the Cows, yeah. Melvins and and others. <laughs> um so yeah, there's that. So I mean, you know, but I didn't play on it, so I can I can I can at least promote it and not not have it be like a shameless self promotion. <laughs> and even if Who cares? Um, yeah, exactly. Right. Because that's why I'm here anyway. <laughs> basically, right. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's let's settle one question that I have been trying to solve. Um, okay. I know back in the 90s, you released a record through MRAP called Brick. Mm -hmm. And rumor has it that you already had a contract with Atlantic. Is that right? Hey. You, you yeah. did? Is that the reason why Melvin's is written in mirror writing? Yeah, I think they said, oh, you know, well, first off, we're like, oh, we want to do this record on this label. And they're like, well, we might want to put it out. I'm like, you're not going to want to put it out. <laughs> like, okay. And then they listen to it and they're like, all right, I'll tell you what, just, re just put the name backwards and you guys can do it. We're like, okay. So they're pretty easy to with stuff like that, you know? I mean, You've You they knew we were kind of a weirdo band, so at least mm. some of them did. I, I think that's the good point about it. I think back then, um, labels could still expect bands to sell items, right, and, and units. And nowadays, they are fighting for every single record that you can sell. Um, let's oh, get yeah, the, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> let's get to the new record, Bad Mood Rising. Um The record starts with one of the longest Melvin's songs. Mr. Dog is it totally is. right. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't look up everything, but like with 13 or 14 minutes, it's definitely one of your longest ones. How did it happen? It that how did it happen that the song got so long? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wasn't there when that happened. Otherwise, I might have made it shorter. Um, no, uh, I think. I think that the idea was to write some massive epic song, <laughs> really. Um, all the songs in the record, actually, Buzz and Steven went off and, and did some demos of everything. Mm -hmm. So, and then came back because I wasn't invited. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know why I wasn't there. I think, I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was just whatever, you know, I might've been busy or something. Um, No, really, I'm not really sure at all. Other than all of a sudden, yeah, they went on this. They 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 went on this uh, uh, um, soul searching, truth finding uh, uh, mission to come up with songs, and went to the desert and came back with uh, all these songs on Bad Mood Rising, and uh, and one of them was yeah that long song. It was like, fuck, I got to learn this thing, Jesus. So, um, but I did, and we're even playing it live. So, yeah, you better yeah. shit, right? If if you do something like that, then you got to play it live, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, and 
you know, on this last bit of touring that we just did, we're only playing two of the songs live, but I mean, it's like, you know, a half hour, <laughs> yeah, isn't, half isn't hour of the show. A, no. Isn't there another track on where, which is basically like 10 minutes? So yeah, it's half an hour. Right? There's some long ones. I mean, there's only six songs on the record, so they're all pretty long. Yeah, but there is also a very short one on it, which is like two minutes and 30 seconds or something like that, if I remember correctly. So it's a, a wide variety of track lengths. Um, yes. Get, getting a little bit more into Mr. Dog is totally right. Uh, I don't know if it's only my impression. But maybe you can give me yours. Isn't it something like a suite, like a, a neoclassical thing with like very, very different parts? Movements. Which are, which which are basically only connected through that very sharp and prestige, pretty austere like riffs, like the sound of it. But otherwise, the tracks, the track parts sometimes feel as if it's like, okay, this is part one, where you are oh, yeah, featured yeah, yeah. a lot. Then it's part For... two. Then it's part and and so on. You know what I mean? I'm featured a lot. Fortunately. <laughs> yeah <laughs> good for me um yeah no you're right it, it's yeah there's there's different different movements to the whole thing at least like yeah there's that whole beginning drum intro yeah and then and then yeah there's at least two two or three different it's almost like two or three different songs all in one mm. and even those songs again are pretty long um what i like about it is at the beginning, you are featured very heavily. Your drumming is like the center of it all, of course. Right. Um, but then it seems as if you're taking a little step back and let the other two guys step up front. And it sounds a little bit like, like a humble thing, but still shining through at basically every corner. But it's not as if your drums are taking over. How did you find your place in all of that music? Yeah, I mean, it 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 all came together pretty quickly, you know. I think I recorded the I recorded that record in just a couple of days, you know. Wow. Learned, learned, and recorded it. So, okay. there you go. I don't know. I just, I I uh, uh, I just sat down and absorbed it and did it. So, so Felt did it. the two guys basically already give you like? Okay, we would like to have this drum beat, or we would like to have that here and there. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I mean, well, so compared to maybe other, and probably every other Melvin's record, um, I had something. I had, I had something to work with that was already solid that was there. You know, I wasn't sitting in the room with those guys showing me the parts. Like they already, you know, there was already a demo that existed, so I could just, I could just sit there and learn it, and come up with my own stuff. And I'm sure, I mean, it was, like I said, it was done so quickly um, that, I mean, I know that there was like, definitely like suggestions on things, mm. um, but like a little bit like, like, um, you know, like the whole beginning of that song, yeah. you know, that, that was like, you know, there were like a few ideas thrown around, like, you know, we want to have this whole drum beginning, mostly buzz, you know, going, I want to have this whole drum beginning thing and just kind of gave me a, like a little example of what it would sound like. And then I just went in and created it. You know, when you're talking about examples, did he give you like other songs where he said like, okay, I like this here. Or did he give you like beats, tempos? Um, a little bit of both, you know, I mean, there, there was definitely a reference to something, mm -hmm. you know, that I won't say, cause it's kind of a secret. But uh, um, it's something that we're, we're fans of. So, um, okay. so yeah, um, it's kind of like you know, often we'll do things like like if we're writing songs, he'll go play kind of like you know what would what would the drummer from Gang of Four do? You know? Oh, so it's Gang of Four. That kind of thing. No, that's just that's just that's just something <laughs> that it could be. Doesn't sound like Gang of Four. It's no, more yeah. soundtracky. It's it's more of a soundtrack type of thing. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And at the same time, the beginning to me sounds a lot like something that Queen could have written in their heydays. Uh, Queen, very sim yeah, very simple one. and very simple, but still very, very effective. Right. Um, there are other tracks on the record, for example, 
one of the last ones, the receiver and the empire state, uh, where oh, yeah. it seems as if you are given free range to do whatever it wants. There are like little, uh, let's say like little Latin things in between or however we want to call it, like a lot of nice percussive elements hidden in the mix. Oh, yeah. Um, was right. that like that, that was where coming. they said like, that is here, do whatever you like. No. <laughs> Again, not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, that one, I probably just, yeah, I mean, I mean, it was, you know, that was kind of more of uh, almost like a straight up rocker for the mm -hmm. Melvins, you know, it's yeah. got a couple of little twists in the riff here and there, mm -hmm. uh, things that Buzz likes to call hiccups. But, uh, um, but I mean, otherwise it was like, you know, no, I just sat there and kind of figured out a part. And um, I don't, I mean, on that one, I don't really remember having like, much direction, you know? Um, I mean, I, I had funny because I'd had like the demos for a while before I went in and recorded it. And I just kind of like sat and thought about things for a while, I guess, you know? So I kind of knew them when I went in and then kind of had to, you know, I knew them in my head. And then I went in and, and had to, you know, and at least I, I knew what I kind of wanted to do. I knew what I was going to try to do. <laughs> You also achieved it. Okay. <laughs> it's something that struck me after listening to it for several times, um, or not only the song, but the whole album. What you struck me was there is, again, this huge diversity of the tracks. We know sometimes we even find nearly nearly popish melodies on the record, like My Discomfort is Radiant, or It Won't, or It Might, where Buzz gives us some very nice, and for him, even pop lyrics or not lyrics but uh melodies how do you like yeah. those tracks oh i love them i think that sounds great i mean cliche for an artist to always say like this is this is one of my favorite records but i mean i really found myself listening to it a lot after we made it you know um i really yeah i mean there's some great songs on there um i really like hammering a lot and kind yeah. of hope that we start playing that one live it almost almost has kind of like a a little bit of a bowie vibe mm -hmm. bowie meets his easy top i guess it's interesting you know, that sort of that at least that's kind of yeah i i get what you mean. that's kind of what i heard yeah um, and um even in like my like there's vocal parts i did where definitely like the song inspired me and i mean i was kind of thinking of of Bowie when I was singing it, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so there you go. Well, he's a, he's a good person to think about. Yeah, and that's, I mean, like if if you say that you're emulating Bowie, that is never a bad thing, you know. <laughs> I, I would, for at least not for me. Um, and then on the other hand, we have some really hard hitting stuff like "Never Say You're Sorry," which is like a hard hitting noise monster in disguise, and totally. you know. What I love about those all of those tracks is that they're so diverse. Is that where the Melvins are best at right now? Not doing a genre record, but just doing a Melvins record, whatever we want to do? I guess so. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of different things in there, but I think, I guess I felt that it was pretty consistent, you know? It's definitely like, I mean, we just, before this record put out, um, you know, a 35 plus song acoustic record. So this one is definitely uh, back to brutal, heavy metal-ish type of stuff that we do, I yeah. think. That's definitely true, but it's also at the same time pretty diverse in itself, which I like a lot. You know, sure. it's, it, 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 it takes you by the hand. It leads you through a whole kaleidoscope of different sounds. It also punches you in the face sometimes. <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, oh, are you still there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, um, yeah, it's psychedelic too, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of kaleidoscopes. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I really like this record a lot. So I can um, imagine. So. I, hope, I mean, like you've been playing, you've been playing with Buzzo for nearly forty years, right now, right? 
Yep. So is it, am I right in assuming that you understand him blindfolded or without words? Uh, musically, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I can, I, I, I know him pretty well musically. He can still throw me for a loop, that's for sure. But you know, <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at figuring out his tricks and stuff like that. I've had a lot of practice, so helps with other things too. If I play other people's music, it's like really, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think the stuff we do is pretty complicated, you know, um, mm -hmm. musically. I mean, I know that our bass player Steven has said that it's like. I mean, he likes it, but definitely he's like, this is some of the most complicated stuff that I've ever played. Um, yeah, I mean, like but he it's plays, fun, he's, too. I mean, like, he plays an off, so. Sure. And I mean, he's, <laughs> that he's is definitely really less complicated. <laughs> it is, but I mean, he's also played, played and learned, like, some insane amount of Sparks yeah. records. Yes. So, you know, like like, almost 20 records or something like that. So it's like, you know, He's he's no slouch, and and nope. um, and um, you know, for him to say that is is that kind of means something for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I, I can't remember where I was going with this. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll pick I'll pick up what you said. You said you were speaking about Steven. So, uh, since Steven joined the band, you're back behind the drum kit, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always been. I've always been back there. I just I just come out to play bass for the Melvins of nineteen eighty three. Yeah. And so I I guess that's the spot where you feel most at home, right? Oh yeah. The drums for sure. Yeah. And but I also know that you play the bass and is that something that in your opinion goes hand in hand, or did you have to learn how to play the bass? Um no, I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm actually a guitar player first yeah. you know that's the, that, that was my that was my first instrument was guitar mm -hmm. so I switched to drums because I was telling the drummer how to play drums and and then realized that oh I I, I know how to play drums I didn't really but I mean I just decided it was fun and um, there were too many guitar players so um, anyway being a guitar, a guitar player you know, Bass has only got four strings, and you know why that is, right? That that is because three of them are spares. Play... Because yeah. because three of them are spares, <laughs> and so so yeah. I don't I, know. I mean, it's um, and you're you're basically I, already leading me to another thing about the Melvins and about you yourself, which I like okay. a lot. Um, being a huge Zeppa fan. I always think about bands in a certain way that Zeppa has asked. And you also, I think, have an answer to that. Zeppa's question, like, does humor belong in music? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, yes. Is is that something that you only think is true for yourself, but also for the whole Melvin's band? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, first off, the band name is the Melvins, so I mean that should clue you into something right there. First off, but I mean, you know, we've always been fans of bands like the Who, and certainly mm -hmm. those guys have humor in their stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, Marianne with a shaky hand, that stuff's funny. <laughs> would, would you agree that having humor in your music does not mean? but you take your music lightly. All oh, right. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're very serious. Yeah. But also, we're, you know, yeah, we can poke fun at ourselves for sure. You but know? isn't that um, also a way that you have to do it if you want to last 40 years? Probably so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, so I, I I had to look it up for, for this interview and... Um, I bought this like a few years ago. Um, I, I guess you know this. It's um, this the reach, oh, oh, okay. the reach tribute. How did you right. feel when you heard that there are bands like Boris? I mean, like of course Boris, Isis, Agoraphobic Nosebleed, Mastodon. How did you feel when you heard? Okay, those bands are going to record some of our tracks. Yeah. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing, you know. Um, 
I like the Mastodon track a lot for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, there's um, there's another band that did a, a Melvin's cover that I thought they did a really great job, and it was a total surprise because we were playing live with them, and I didn't know that they were going to play a Melvin song, and I'm sitting in the dressing room, and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, what the fuck? Um, and it's this band Helms Ali, and they did a cover about the steak, and I thought it was actually really good. So. Yeah. So if I mean like I know that the Melvins have also covered some some songs. So oh, yeah, this, we're basically a cover band. Yeah, I mean like always CCR, right? We've never done a CCR song, surprisingly. We probably should. Should do it, should yeah. do it on this next tour. We could. Actually, though, But, you know what? I, um, I played drums in this band, Shrine Builder. That yeah. was uh, uh, an all-star lineup of Stoner Rock dudes, I guess. Stone yeah. Rock dudes. I it was Al from Sleep. Um, I know. Wino from Why no and Scott Kelly. Yeah. Right. So I we, also have one question about that band later, but you go ahead with what you want to say. Oh, we did it. We did do a CCR cover. Which one? We did a song called Effigy. Oh, ah, yeah. So, which is a great one. But, I mean, like, apart from CCR... Is there a track that you would like to cover with the Melvins or with any of your other projects? Um, sure. Um, oh, you mean one in particular? Um, I've got some ideas. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. But yeah, yes, okay. and yes, I will. And if you could choose an artist to cover one of your tracks, I mean, like apart from those that we already know, but. If you could choose mm. an artist to cover one of your tracks, do you have an idea which track should be covered by which artist or project? Oh gosh, I don't know. I've never thought of that. Um, um, well, it'd have to be somebody really popular. <laughs> and okay. um, sure, and then they'd have to cover. Um, well, they'd have to do. <laughs> they'd have to do the bit because <laughs> because I helped write that one. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, let's say. Uh, um, oh, how about the Beatles doing a Melvin song? There you go. That would be that would probably sell really good. That would sell pretty good. We know, but we know um, it we, never happened. Yeah, we know. I was just thinking. You know, I would. Say, I I hoped you would say something like, "Okay, let's let's have Billy Eilish do Boris or something like that." I could. Yeah, sure. Well, that would be good. <laughs> I was almost going to say her, but I thought that'd be too typical. So. Yeah, but if we're talking about pop, popular and still like with a little bit of scene credibility, I think then we're good with Billie Eilish. I don't care about the credibility. Just, you know, just just units, which you don't sell anything nowadays, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, stream. Um, I get that, yeah, those pay a lot. Yes. <laughs> Said lot. nobody ever. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I saw that statistic a, f a few days ago, but it takes like What is it? Five thousand, six thousand songs to get a band the same amount of money as when you buy one shirt. Oh, yeah. Well, you know that that that's not a new story. Artists have been yeah. getting ripped off forever. So, you know, just a different way. You yourself have played in a multitude of bands and worked and toured with many of the most famous front men ever. You know, we have Scott Kelly, Wino, <laughs> yeah. Kurt Cobain, Mike Patton, Keith Morris for McDonald's, and of course, King Buzzo. If we yeah. now exclude Buzz from that list. Working with which of those was for you easiest and most natural? Ooh, um, of the ones that you, that you picked? Or any other that you Or any Or anyone. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, easiest. Well, you know, um, we did this thing a few years ago called Crystal Fairy with yeah. Terry Genderbender, and mm -hmm. and um, we wrote songs with her, and that was really easy. Like, okay. um, you know, unfortunately, the whole thing kind of took a dump, but um, it was really, really easy to write songs with her. Like, we'd just get into like we just. We decided that it would be fun to like start a band with her, mm -hmm. and um, and like yeah, that'd be great. And like I, the first day we got together, we're like, what kind of song should we write? And we just all of a sudden had three songs written and recorded. 
In one day? All in all. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that one was really easy. Um, the stuff that we did with like Jello Biafra was much longer and more time consuming um, and more involved. But, um, but that, what do you, you mean know, with more just involved? A, a lot more time. Mm -hmm. A lot more time in the whole thing. A lot, a lot, a lot, um, a lot longer time sitting around writing songs. Actually, a lot of it was just sitting around bullshitting. And then eventually we'd get around to like trying to work on something. So okay. that just took a longer time. <laughs> but I hope that still you like the outcome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just uh, that, that's like the, the, uh, um, two ends of the spectrum, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but just, you know, that one, you know, the stuff with her was really immediate and, and was amazing on how like, I thought we came up with really good stuff on such a short amount of time, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but we had, I don't know, we just, with Jello, we just spent more time, you know, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But also he's a different kind of songwriter. So I can imagine. Um, mm -hmm. so let, let's talk about a few of your projects, but before that, I have a question because I mean, like I've said, you've, you've recorded and worked on so many records. Let's repeat it. If anybody has got all of the Dale Crover records that he ever put out, hit us up and I'm sure Dale will come up with a special present. Um, but hey, hey, hey don't, don't, not, don't make me give promises that I can't. No, I fulfill. give promises that you can keep. Okay. Yeah. But I uh, let's let's get to the question. I mean, if you've been involved in so many things, uh, would you say that you are something of a workaholic? Um. It, yeah, with, so. Without I mean, the negative, without the negative as aspects of the term, you know, like. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I mean. You know, a lot of it, I mean, we get stuff done because, you know, one of us will will insist. No, I mean, what I mean is is that, like, with Buzz, he really likes to work, you know, and make sure that we're constantly working mm -hmm. and uh, um, planning ahead and, and just keeping busy. You know, we kind of have to do things that way. We, mm -hmm. We're not in a financial situation with the band where, you know, like I said, nobody sells records. So we have to constantly keep working. We can't sit around and, and mm -hmm. take years off. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole that whole time during COVID was just it was horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, horrible to sit around for two years and do nothing. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we tried to uh, do as much as we could. But, um, yeah, yeah, I like playing too. So, mm -hmm. and I like when people offer me stuff. So, mm -hmm. so to answer your question, yes. It does. Um, and, and then the other side of it, uh, you said that you like playing, but I guess that there are also much more questions for collaborations than the number of collaborations that you do, right? I guess Say you turn down more, I guess you turn down more collaborations than you accept. Oh, I don't know. I mean, usually it's us wanting to work with somebody in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's even stuff that we're working on now, collaborative stuff. So can't can't say what it is, but I can say we're doing something, <laughs> which is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, other bands that you were in, you said that um, you've been in, in Shrine Builder with Scott L and Wino. Uh, mm -hmm. Would would you be open to work with? two of those again on another project possibly yeah i i don't want to get into all that other thing you know what i mean right you know let's just say sure yeah i know what you're talking about and uh okay. yeah it's, a, it's a crazy um a couple of those guys i haven't talked to in a long time um and one of them i i do talk to mm -hmm. so i talked to al mm-hmm so For everybody who doesn't know us, we're, we're talking about El Cisneros, who, was, who is and was in Ohm and in Sleep. So we should yep. never forget that. You've also yep. worked with one of my youth favorites. 
not first line, but definitely second line Red Cross. Uh, oh, yeah. to, together with a McDonald's again. Um, so yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about the attention that the band has seen since the reunion nearly 20 years ago? Do you think it's deservedly or, as I would say, not enough? Yeah, not enough. But um, there's a documentary coming out really soon. I think it's almost finished. And um, I haven't seen it. But um, mm -hmm. the guy that, that's doing it seems like I mean, he's really put a lot of work into it, and he's, mm -hmm. I guess, I know he's done some kind of biggish things, like mm -hmm. some TV stuff that was kind of big. So, um, I hopefully it does great. You know, um, I think it's going to be pretty cool, and yeah, we're hoping to get the band going again. At least I hope they get it going again because I'd like to. I'd like to play with them as well. Um, we had plans before the pandemic. We were on our way to Europe pretty much before everything got shut down. So, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, we haven't done anything since, but um, I really, really like to get back to doing stuff with those guys. Um, I know they've been trying to work on some new tunes and I think the goal might be to eventually try to do a new record. So, but I hope we can get out and play live too. Mm -hmm. That would be very yeah. nice. Yeah, I, I guess yes. that with those guys, it's not very difficult to A, get along, B, be on tour, and C, be on stage, right? I, I, with I the Red Cross guys? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I did, we did a bunch of stuff. Like, we went, we did a U.S. tour on our own. We did, we've done actually, mm -hmm. like, that, that tour, the last time we did tour was with Melvin's, where we did, like, over 50 shows. So, that was really good, and that was just in the U.S., and we went to Europe um, with Melvin's once, and then we went to Spain by ourselves, and we also went to Australia. So, um, yeah, I hope I hope we can do. I want to do more. I'm hoping a U.S. tour next time. Let, let Let me get one thing right neck connected to that. So, if you say that you played like 50 or a little bit more shows together with the Melvins and Red Cross, was that exhausting for you or was it so much fun that you didn't think about okay this is a lot of work i mean it, yeah it wasn't it was fine i mean i survived <laughs> you know i mean well steven also said this to me he's like oh the red cross is set great you know we get to play that and then i'm so warmed up for the melvin set that, that it makes it seem easier so you know and i was like yeah i think so too cool. you know it's like it really it really was like you know, I mean, there, there's definitely two different styles, but after playing the Red Cross set, it was like, yeah, I'm warmed up and ready to go. It was good. It was a fun tour. Um, I, being born in 1978, you can imagine which which band or which few bands got me into heavy music. And you were at the beginning of one of them. Wow. You, were in Nir you were in Nirvana. And I'm pretty Sorry. sure that you have, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure that you have not looked back at your decision to leave Seattle and Aberdeen and Nirvana, because I I don't think you're the kind of guy who looks back on something with crying eyes. But when the '90s happened and Nirvana got so big, how was it for you to watch? Of your former bandmate and your former friend deteriorate, deteriorate so much? Oh, that was horrible. You know, I mean, yeah, it was a bummer. It was like, you know, watching a car crash in slow motion, I guess, as people say. Um, yeah, really unfortunate, you know. Did, so. were, were, you at, were you at that point still in contact with Kurt? Oh yeah, we played the very last Nirvana show ever. You know, I mean that oh, yeah. was the last time I saw him. Yeah, last time I saw him or spoke to him was was at their very last show, and then basically the next Rome. day he went to Rome, mm -hmm. and uh, had his his first uh, suicide attempt. So, yeah, I don't uh... know. It was very strange. It was very strange because I mean, at that point and after that, we were kind of all just kind of watching it on TV with everybody else. You know, yeah. we were um, 
we were still in Europe when that had happened and um, had just flown home. Actually, we had just flown to the East Coast and we were about to start a U.S. tour when we got the news. Our road crew had driven all the way from from Los Angeles out to uh, New York to meet us and start this tour. And they were really worried that we were going to cancel the whole thing, you know, and um, we realized that that would be a big mistake, you know, I mean, and it was just, I don't know, you know, yeah, you could kind of see it happening and there's nothing you could do about it. Mm. Um, of course, we also have to take this interview again a little bit more on the light side. So I got to ask, <laughs> what, what did you Kurt ask? You wanted to I ask. know. I you had to. to. I did. But I also have a question that I think is on the lighter side. What did Kurt smell like? <laughs> <laughs> um, edge shaving cream. There's your answer. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, something that, that I like is that you have been involved in so many different styles and so many different bands and so many different genres. Um, uh, what is more difficult for you, um, playing something austere and taken back or some grind ish madness like Phantomas? <laughs> wait which do what was that which one do i like better which one's yeah. which one's easier Both, um, maybe yeah i i mean yeah well like i said i mean after playing after playing melvin stuff everything's easier <laughs> Every, anything Phantom else is easy even phantomas yeah okay. i mean i mean that stuff's hard but like the music is there's it's in little spurts yeah. little blast parts you know so yeah. it's not like yeah. it's not like um it's not like i had to go and do that stuff for like you know five minutes at a time so yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and i mean easy for me to understand where he's coming from after playing in the melvins for so long you know mm -hmm. yeah. um I, I i'm still thinking about whether okay um so you were you were named one of you were named one of the best 70 drummers in the world a few years ago. By I was American number magazine. 69. Come on. Number 69. Okay. You were one of the best drummers in the world. And because I, I no, I'm number 69. So. I'm number 69 and I'm sticking with it. That's my number I'm... from now on. <laughs> but I mean, like, on, I, I would mean... still... I would still say it's too low, but but no, I I was I was yeah, but I mean I wouldn't some... I wouldn't want sixty eight or anything like that. If it, if you're gonna put me up there, then you know, sixty nine is perfect. If I yeah, can't be best... number one, I want to be number sixty nine. Yeah, best sexual position. Well, it's a good but, starting position, maybe. Definitely, <laughs> uh, but. Um, I mean, like, uh, mm. apart from apart from number sixty eight, who was ahead of you, what would be your favorite drummers of all time? Let's say number seventy one. That's no. Um, who is my favorite drummer? Yeah, or maybe two or three. You know, are there some drummers where you say, like, okay, I I totally love whatever they do. Well, they do. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's stuff like that, but I mean, and there's tons of drummers. I mean, and you probably can guess all the drummers that I'm really into, but uh, um. I really don't like tell bands. me Ringo Starr. I could. Why not? Ringo's great. Yeah. You don't like Ringo? I mean, like the guy married a. I'm. I mean, the guy play, married a Playboy model. You know, we should all be. She was a Bond girl. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Right. Come on. Um, no, I, I actually really do like Ringo's drumming. Go listen to that okay. song, Rain. Okay. You know, you'll see. I will. I will it's visit great. it again. But. And I mean, like, is, apart from the greats, you know, I mean, like, Page, Bonham, Moon, apart from those, right, is right, there right. anyone in particular where he's like, okay, that's a um, really good drummer? I mean, I was really into, like, heavy metal drummers, you know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what I, when, when I was learning. I really liked the first Iron Maiden drummer, Clive Burr. I thought he was really great. Mm -hmm. um, the drummer from that played on Unleashed in the East by Led Zeppelin. Less, less Binks. I kind of always talk about these guys, but um, I don't know. Let me think. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody that 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 
I could name that people not, might not think, you know, um, God, how about know. somebody like buddy guy, buddy guy. Yeah. But he's a guitar player or, oh uh, no, what is it? No, what is it? Um, oh, buddy rich, uh, buddy rich. Sorry. Right. How about that? Cubby from the Musketeers. That's a good one. Cubby actually. Okay. Um, Oh, there's a new band um, that I like that we did some shows with called Taipei Houston. And okay. um, they are a duo, okay. um, bass and drums. And uh, they're both really good. The drummer is really, really good. Um, okay. I mean, they both are, but um, they're actually the sons of the drummer from Metallica, Lars Ulrich. Okay. So anyway, this guy's a really, really good drummer. You have to check him out. <laughs> I will. So. So there's somebody new. There's yeah, a, that's always good. Drummer. Yeah, that's always good. It was I got fun two watching more because yeah, go ahead. I got two more questions before um, we go to our infamous quick fire round. Um, okay. One of them: if you could assemble a dream band of musicians, past or present, that you have not worked with, and you are a drummer, who else would be in the band? Um, it'd be. Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. and me, because we could just be a two piece. <laughs> Makes it a lot easier to travel, right? I take I take Hendrix on guitar. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take I'll take um, I'll take Paul McCartney on bass. Um, let me see. I'll I'll um, hmm. second guitar player synth. Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, yeah, second guitar player. Okay, let's go with. Uh, um, let me think of a good one. Um, how about Billy Gibbons? That'd be a good one. So I got Billy Hen one. Hendrix, Paul McCartney. Um, um, let's throw Elton John in there on piano, and and everything else. That'd be good. I'd pay for that. Right. Sure. And I, I got to ask one thing, and that's the last question. But okay. how the hell did you, Tim Moss, and Billy Anderson choose the most unsearchable name ever? Horn. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah like that it. wasn't my doing. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, that's that got to be horrible. It's like, what would work? Porn band, maybe? I think nothing with porn would work because, you know. I know. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that was really Tim Moss's band. So yeah. I was just along for the ride for a minute. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always end our interviews with our quick fire round. It's like a few questions where you get two alternatives. Like, which one do you like more, roses or tulips? Sure. And you choose. Choose. Tulips. And then please give a short... <laughs> My wife would say this. So. Uh, you choose and maybe give a short explanation. Uh, Seattle <laughs> or Los Angeles? Well, Los Angeles, because it doesn't rain there every day. Okay. Old Spice versus Teen Spirit. <laughs> I'll go for the Old Spice, because that's okay. what my dad used to wear. Okay. Uh, Halo of Flies versus Helios Creed. The band? Mm-hmm. Or the song? No, the band. Okay, the band. Mm, that's a tough one, but I really like Halo Flies a lot. Um, okay. Because because they like mod music. Mm -hmm. And so do I. Jesus Lizard versus Cop Shoot Cop. Um, probably Jesus Lizard, because I certainly know more about them. The Obsessed versus Spirit Caravan. Um, that's like the same band, more or less. I mean, <laughs> nearly. So, I mean, you it's both wino. Yeah, that's why. I, that's why. I, I suppose that's the tough one. I mean, they're both. Yeah, I mean, I've seen them both live, and they're both really good. So, but I mean, it's wino. So, the Obsessed, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Faith No More or Mr. Bungle? Hmm. Gosh, I don't, I don't know. Um, tough one. Um, Phantom Moss. 
There you go. <laughs> uh, Black Flag or Roland's Band? Oh, Black Flag, come on. <laughs> Although I gotta admit that my favorite, favorite Roland's track ever is Liar. Oh, yeah. I saw them. I mean, I, believe me, I've got nothing against the Rollins band. I saw them a couple times and I thought they were great. So, um, but, you know, definitely Black Flag was a big deal. Mm, definitely. Unsane or today is the day? Oh, gosh. Unsane. Mm -hmm. And now we. <laughs> These other guys I, are I, all going to hate me. You, you're you're, no, you're making me make enemies. No, 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 no. Nobody makes enemies with the Melvins. Uh, wine, red wine or white wine? <laughs> um, it depends on what time of the year it is. But um, right now, right now would be this. It's kind of red wine season, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. right? What do you enjoy more, touring or writing and recording? Ooh, um, God, they're both so different. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I and I know, know that I one mean, doesn't work with the other. But which one do you enjoy more? That's really tough. I mean, but I, okay. I, I think create creating, you know, creating music is. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely, you know. Mm -hmm. My last question, and you will know why I chose those, and we'll clue it up after. Okay. You have to choose one of two albums, Up the Dose, or You Axed for it. <laughs> um, God, I can't remember which songs are on which record, but um, um, <sighs> Up the Dose. <laughs> that, that's such a great record title. But, uh, yeah. but if I really had to pick one, it would be Trash Baggy EP. Okay. I would, I would because of the venue that it inspired, I would probably choose Whiskey A Go-Go, right? Oh, oh, the live record? Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And um, to clue it up for everybody, uh, Dale also plays, can we call it a cover band? I guess so. What is it? Like for mentors, right? Uh, so, oh, the mentors, uh, that, yeah. So, that's like uh, those were two records by the mentors. And yes. uh, am I right that Christ is also or was also in it? No, Voslich? Oh, you're, you're talking, yeah, not about, the one uh, on the uh, cross, you know, like, uh, well, no, right, right, right. Yeah, so he was in it, right? Yeah, um. Yeah, he played with us. Are you talking about our, our mentors cover band that we had for one night? Yeah, the Mel. What is it? The Mel Tours, right? Oh, maybe I can't even re really remember. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. Um. It was. Oh, one of the bands didn't show up tonight, and we knew a bunch of mentors covers type of thing. So, <laughs> like, okay, we'll so, just play. Oh no, I know what we were called. We were called Simplex One. So, uh, Dale, thanks for taking your time. Everybody, you should enjoy the new Melvin's record. As usual, it's awesome. But I think this one is one of the best ones that they put out in the last, let's say, 15 to 20 years. Sure. Um, Why not? Let's just say 40 years. It's their best record yeah. ever. I, I have a okay, few well, friends who would, who would... It is definitely a very good one. It is definitely right. a very, very I mean, good one. I um, think that if... Well, I'd like to say... And hope if you're a fan of the band that you would really like this record a lot. Yes. And know that we're still hip and relevant and cool. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for taking your time. Um, Thank you. I wish you all the best on the road. I wish you all the best with sales and units and everything. And of yeah. course, we cannot wait to see you guys back on European stages and American stages. You know, yes. For that matter. Um, we'll be there next year. For awesome. sure. Both. All stages. Everywhere. World tour. It's going to happen. It's going to be our awesome. 40th year anniversary. So we're going we're gonna to do it right. Good one. So thanks for taking your time and have a good day, my friend. Okay, you too. You Take too. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.